everyone welcome to our informal talk. It's called The Future of Eye Care. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Quinn Wang. I'm a San Francisco-based cataract surgeon, and I'm also the co-founder and CEO of Quadrant Eye, which is powering remote eye exams. And today I have here with me Dr. Ike Ahmed, who is the rock star of ophthalmology. Um, I think it wouldn't be too out of line to say he's kind of like an ophthalmology version of Michael Jackson, especially when his hair is not up in a bun. Um, he is an academic powerhouse. I think he's given around a thousand talks around the world. Um, and he's a great surgical innovator. He's pioneered the micro-invasive surgery movement within glaucoma surgery and is an expert in complex cataract surgery. Um, cataract surgery meaning, in we call it colloquially phacos. So that's something that will come up throughout the talk. Um, my own eye resume is not as impressive. It's quite short, but I can lay claim to the fact that when I was chief resident at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, I had the unofficial title of FACO Queen. Um, so anyway, let's get started. We have a really interesting mix of healthcare providers and technologists here. So we're going to try to keep the talk a little more high level. There's going to be a short Q and A at the end. So if you have any questions for us, please go ahead and type it in the chat. Okay. So Ike, when we last spoke, we talked about our experiences with tele eye care, and I was hoping that you could share with everyone uh, a little bit about your experiences and success with the ePortal that you've set up, set up at your clinic. Sure. Well, I think like many of you, of course, with the shutdown, I mean, we were, our clinics were closed, our patients were unable to access us, and so we, we had never really ventured into uh, telemedicine or virtual care uh, and overnight actually we designed a new portal we basically designed a, a website for patients to access us for referring physicians to access us and built in a visual acuity uh, test a, a smartphone photography um, instructions to take pictures and upload uh, and uh, Amsler grid and even to do visual field testing online and put it all together uh, to allow patients to access us and so um, didn't know what we we're getting into initially but it worked out quite well and of course, I'm always interrupted by my little daughter. I'm at home. And so, and so we, we now get about 150 of these consults a week now. Uh, and I learned to multitask, as you can see. Um, yeah. what, was, it was, what was amazing, actually, was our ability to do a really a pretty reasonable triage uh, job for those patients that came through. And, uh, and we also set up, though, we knew that we still have to do diagnostics. So we set up a rapid eye assessment center. So patients can still come in and get funded photography and IP measurement. Um, as well as getting uh, potentially a macro CT as well. So, Sophie, you got to do this, baby. Come on. <laughs> now, we'll, now we'll be fine. Uh, and, and, so, and so that's kind of what we set up initially, and, uh, and it's grown. And, and, and it's something I think that I think we won't stop, actually, when we finish or when we get past at least the initial uh, lockdown phase. That's been our early experience. But, of course, this is much more than just even, even uh, that small effort that we did. Mm -hmm. I really, I totally agree in terms of this e-assessment being not limited to this shutdown period. Um, like I was mentioning before, uh, our clinic is open but on a limited basis and I've been using remote eye care, you know, the platform we built through Quadrant Eye as a, a way to cut down on time that people spend in clinic. So. Um, People input their chief complaint, for example, red eye, describe how long it's been going on, go through the basic exams that you have set up in your portal as well, checking their own vision, checking answer grid. And so by the time they show up to clinic, um, I have read their note and come up with a preliminary assessment and plan, and they end up spending only five to 10 minutes physically in clinic, which is great during COVID and immediately post COVID because of public health reasons, but also looking forward really improves clinic flow and efficiency. And well, I think help us 
catch up on the clinic backlog of people who haven't been able to see be seen in these couple months. So, uh, well, and, and, the, and the reality is, even in a even during our regular pre-COVID time, I mean, once we have diagnostics and we have certain information and data points, we pretty well can almost make the diagnosis without seeing the patient. If you think about it, I mean, I, I think we know that uh, for many of our different uh, diseases, and so. If you take that piece and know that you have the ability to intake, uh, there's a lot more we can do, and it may actually allow us to do what we do best, which is to be the physician part of it, to be that counselor, to be that advocate to the patient, uh, to use the art of medicine uh, while leveraging technology. So I think you know uh, it's given us so much now to think about. Uh, it's pushed us. I mean, it's put we all. I mean, what we're talking about today is not new, right? And I think tele whatever it is is very cliche to say. Um, this has been going on for years. I mean, we've been talking about it, thinking about it, but I think what this has given us though is a necessity to do something and now an opportunity to evaluate what it can do. And I hope it'll take some of the shackles away from, you know, progress to uh, move it now into the real world, which is going to be some sort of a hybrid situation. I think that will exist early on at least. And I think that, you know, uh, again, reserving it to telemedicine probably is not really covering enough because we can talk about, you know, anything from screening, diagnostic, education, therapeutics, mm -hmm. Co, you know, collaboration between professionals that we can leverage technology with. We can talk about, uh, you know, everything from, you know, uh, AI and big data and how we can incorporate that into decision making. I mean, it's really endless what I think this can lead to. Mm. Uh, I agree. And so I was curious, you've developed the ePortal, you're getting back into surgery. What is your kind of next step in taking telemedicine? like to a, the next level for your practice? Well, there's a couple of different things. I mean, one, we, we, need, we need the tools to be able to adequately uh, remotely take care of patients or virtuous as patients. So I think continue to refine those are important. We've, you know, the things we miss, for example, by simply doing things virtually are measuring an IOP, for example. We, we have home tonometry devices that we are currently using over the last few years to measure IOP at home over a period of time, like eye care tonometry, rebound tonometry, doesn't require eye drops can be done by a patient on their own. And we're incorporating a feedback system where patients can basically get this delivered, measure the pressure, get it back to us, and we know what they're doing. So, I mean, just getting, that's one example of technology to be able to you know, use, because we can't, of course, look at everything uh, virtually. So that's one piece of it. And the other piece of it is then, how do we incorporate it within our workflow? So now every patient that's coming in, you know, going forward, new patients or follow-up, the first thing we're asking ourselves is, can we do this as a virtual, or does it have to be face-to-face? -face? Can I do an OCT, a visual field, in a home, uh, sorry, an eye care or, or, or some sort of telemetry and not have to see that patient for glaucoma follow-up and do it virtually. Um, can we do, can we incorporate anterior segment OCT, for example, to look at their angles and not have to worry about gonioscopy, again, considering the risk benefits. So it's that kind of modeling, which I think uh, we're also doing, and we have to do to figure out what the right will be in seeing patients. But I, I, think, I think that uh, it's endless. Our cataract side, again, and we can do online education. We can take intake from, from patients as far as uh, you know, what their interests are, uh, get some assessment what their refractive interests are. And then we can have an algorithm for that, do pre-op consultation. They gotta get their biometry, yes, we can't get away from that. Uh -huh. uh, some other further testing, but then we can do it, the rest of it all virtually. So the, the hybrid formulation is what, is what we're trying to work on. And then furthermore, you know, although optometry in Canada has been pretty shut down for the most part, I mean, our patients typically come from optometry. Um, the ability to provide some form of real-time discussion or consultation or some sort of feedback or data collection in real-time could, again, further enhance the, uh, the level of taking care of patients. So what this gets into really, Quinn, is not just doing it for safety, but moving it into the uh, convenience and the, and the quality of taking care of patients. Because I think what, we can't be only driven by safety and by this is safer for you to not be exposed to COVID, right? That's going to be a fine temporary thing. But but I think for this to be long lasting enough, it's gotta be, it's gotta have more values than that. And I think we're talk, we often talk about what works best from us, from our lens, from a physician lens, but we take a step back and we think about it, what works best from our patient's lenses, from their needs and their concerns and from their convenience. I mean, the ability to, to use this as a connector, ability to enhance our, our ability to assess patients, I think it really has a lot of powerful value. And I think this has pushed us toward that direction. So, um... I'm curious now to know, do you kind of envision a future in which people only present physically to clinic for very complex problems and to get surgical pre-op and then post-op care? 
I, I can see that potentially happening. Um, I mean, right now there's a lot of duplication, right? They'll, they'll, patients will often see multiple uh, healthcare providers or eye care providers before they finally get to what they need to do. I can see an immediate ability to address the duplication, for example, by, again, not only using technology, but also collaboration. Um, I see many conditions now where diagnostics give us so much more information than, uh, than we had ever before. Um, that we can, again, eliminate many of these visits. I, I think, for example, going back to our cataract model, I mean, we're looking at only seeing patients the same day preoperatively, right, when they come in, uh, and they've already had everything done, measured, I was selected, uh, the plan already done. But I think lays eyeing on, you know, nothing yet, I think, yet, I should say, replaces our laying, uh, laying eyes on the patient, literally. Uh -huh. And so I think that's, that's something we, we can, again, do right before surgery, as an example. And yes, there'll be people we have to cancel, but it'll be, I think, a small number that the value will still be there for the majority of patients. So I still be, see, see being that. I do think one area we need to digitize, which we haven't done a good job in with. I mean, we've done, we got funders photography, we got map the OCT, we got, uh, you know, um, you know, HD analyzer, we got all these ways to assess visual function. We got surface measurements, we got care to graph, everything we can measure on the eye. I can basically map out that eye without seeing the patient. Uh -huh. But what we haven't done yet is digitize our slit lamp. Right. I mean, that's been, that's been, that's been, that's been for decades and, mm -hmm. dots and you know, uh, I think you, know, you see people now starting to talk about it a bit more and, you know, Quinn, you're always, you're always ahead of the curve. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, that's an area where I think we, we probably need to do a bit more to really truly decouple the, uh, the examination part of it. I love that because I know we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, a remote controlled slit lamp that can be uh, operated by an ophthalmologist or optometrist from a distance. And that can be really beneficial for patients who can't come to the office, whether it be for, whether it be for medical reasons or just like location, geographic limitations. Um, I, I think that the, oh, so for those who don't know, a slit lamp is the workhorse of ophthalmology. It's essentially like a very high powered microscope that allows you to magnify certain parts of the eye and adjust the light into various widths and get you to a point where if you master the slit lamp, you can see a single white blood cell in the front of the eye. And that's like a, tinier than the diameter of a hair. So it's a very powerful instrument. And um, I have been interested in a long time, uh, for a long time in digitizing and adapting the slit lamp for remote care. And through my research, I, I talked to someone at Hogstrite, which is the leading manufacturer of slit lamps. And uh, he said that the technology hasn't change for 150 years uh, and then suggested that because it's been working why should we mess with it uh, but you know COVID has shown us that there's a definite need to innovate and update equipment and if we had had this perhaps we wouldn't be in such a difficult situation right now and not being able to take care of patients. Um, but uh, I don't well, know. I mean, I, isn't, isn't the most dangerous phrase to progress? I mean, that's the way we've always done it. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, as, as opposed to the disruptive world, we just, we just hate to hear that. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Sometimes we need a bit of, of a kick in the butt to tell us, you know what, this is, this is not the right way to do it uh, in, in modern times. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and I think, you know, I mean, w again, we've all been talking about this in, within healthcare in general, and and no doubt, I mean, health data is a is a huge commodity. The big companies are all looking at this, of course. The big Googles and Apples and Samsung and others. I, I just think that the eye is just the perfect source of that. I mean, we've got you know the window to so many different parts of of the body through our eyes. We've got we're very technology heavy with all the instrumentation we do and the diagnostics we have. Uh, we're very uh, data driven, um, which I think uh, helps decision making and inform us. So we've got we've got the ingredients to potentially um, do a lot with this. And I think the one thing that I do worry people worry about is, I mean, when we go to all this technology automation and virtual care, do we lose that patient doctor relationship? And I, I actually think, in my experience over even two months, that in fact I think it may be quite the opposite. And I think when we're when we're so rushed in the clinic and doing things and physically in, in the middle of things, 
I think we lose some of that. And the reality is when we can actually decouple some of it and spend time to actually talk to the patient virtually on video, it's like, it's like a FaceTime conversation like I'm doing now with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that is a one-on-one, you know, you know attention, attention-driven uh, task, which um, I think may actually, may, people may find it to be actually more enhanced. And my patients actually who we call or video call, I don't think they've been more appreciative of that. And a part of it is because, of course, what's going on now. But I think that the value of that being as physicians doing it, it takes us out of the te- technician part of it, which I think is what we, what we often get ourselves caught into and allows us to be the physician part of what we do, which I think is what we are trained to do and why we took the Hippocratic Oath and what we do uh, is meaningful to patients. So actually, I think there's a win if we do this right. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely notice that in my encounters with patients, whether it be on the phone or video or in person, because everything has been decompressed and there's this um, the barrier of having to move clinic is removed. Um, I'm providing better care and uh, the patients can, they notice that, like you mentioned. Uh, so it's been pretty satisfying. Um, I kind of wanted to circle back to the remote controlled slit lamp because I think care, but also enabling us to provide all sorts of care from a distance. So remote controlled slit lamp, maybe one day automated robotic cataract surgery. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I have full faith in, in human innovation that we can basically do anything. Uh, and so I think some of these things are low hanging fruit. I think I think uh, a digital slit lamp, I, I don't believe is, is going to be very complicated to, to, to do. Uh, I think that, um, you know, again, the ability to decouple some of this stuff, I think, is an advantage that we can have with it. And I think that's something that uh, is very doable. As far as robotic cataract surgery is concerned, again, uh, I, I mean, you know, again, cataract surgery has become such and not, not, and not to devalue it, of course, I want to be careful not to devalue it, but uh, it has become very automated with the, with, the, with the innovation that we see from the cataract surgery manufacturers and the, and the technology that's, that's really come forward that I think we are certainly able to certainly use a, you know, assisted at least uh, technologies you've seen, you know, some parts of the world and some of the innovations there. So I, I do see some ability to automate even more on that and standardize even more on that. Again, it's going to be a, it's going to be a matter of the value add here and the uh, and the cost involved, of course, in terms of justifying it. So, but I mean, as far as doing it, possibly, I think it, I think yeah. I mean, certainly, robot assisted is is not is not something that is uh, is something that's already here, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm kind of thinking um, of a scenario in which perhaps a patient who needs cataract surgery and has pretty straightforward cataracts, like plus two NS, can go to a place and be operated on buy a robot and then get post-op care through phone calls or video conferencing. And the, that kind of notion, that sort of future is really exciting to me because that means a lot more people can get cataract surgery and a lot less like geographic restrictions as well if we have like these centers set up and maybe there are multiple robots operating on people um very cool i i kind of you, like, you like robots <laughs> i don't really understand them maybe if i did i would like them less but um it, it is what it is i think there's a role for that um i also i also was wondering like if we have this future, what role bilateral cataract surgery would play in that? Because um, we're in a surgical backlog now, right? And then giants like Kaiser and Thomas Oding at Iowa have been promoting bilateral same-day cataract surgery. Uh, I think it's interesting. I would want to try it. What about you? Well, I'll be honest with you. We've been doing this for maybe, I don't know, 15 years um, I mean, it's, 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 it's not uncommon, certainly in, in, with me and my patients and, and our group to do that. Uh, obviously, we need to have great outcomes, we need to have great refractive outcomes, we need to be showing we have, uh, uh, you know, optimal, uh, you know, very, very low infection rates. Maybe there's an argument to be using intercameral for every case like that for that reason. Um, but I mean, it's from a patient perspective, it is, it is such a better experience for patients to have to, to go through this once and have bilateral 
uh, you know, fusion and bilateral recovery. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much better experience for the patient. Of course, during COVID, there's even more concerns about the additional exposure coming in multiple times. Uh, and so there's a benefit for that. And then, of course, from the backlog perspective, yes, there certainly is. So the arguments have been there for, all, for many, many years, and big organizations have been doing it, yes. Of course, there are re reimbursement drivers, and I have to say again, we cannot ignore that. Some of these great ideas are going to be you know, limited by what we can do in terms of reimbursement. That drives a lot. Cost effectiveness will drive it. And of course, political and territorial concerns will all, always come into play, which can certainly kibosh certain things if we don't do it right. But bilateral surgery, one of those things to me is a no-brainer now in modern day cataract surgery. In fact, I will say that, you know, you know, again, putting aside the 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 need to have a physician-patient relationship, which is very important. Don't get me wrong. I think that can be done virtually, however. But being able to do everything diagnostically preoperatively, meeting you on the day of your surgery, assessing your eye, doing your bilateral surgery, and then even your post-op visits, I, I would even challenge the notion to have to see you back the first few days. Uh, in fact, as you've probably seen from some of the data and some of the studies out there that simply doing a simple phone consult, if you're seeing well and you're comfortable and you don't have any other pre-existing diseases, I think we can be quite certain you're going to be fine. You don't need to come in for, for an IP check, for example. Of course, we need to have the right ways to be able to test people if there's a problem. And really, the only time they need to really get in again and then even that could be done in different ways virtually would be to get a refraction and get if they need to wear glasses. And, and again, for that reason, we've been doing, of course, a lot of different presbyopic lenses. So literally, patients may only need to see a provider once, literally, if we do this right, uh, and, and it works out that way. Of course, there are many different ways why it won't work out. I'm not, I'm not debating that. But we just think it can work out for some people. That's a start. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I can assure you it can grow. We can do wide field imaging if we need to, detect people's retinas and everything else. We can do a lot of things diagnostically and not necessarily have to encumber everybody in the whole physical pathway. So that's something that we are already talking about now because we have to get onto it now with mm -hmm. doing surgery, like the surgery now. In terms of doing things like uh, fundus photography, right now we're kind of tethered to the hardware and limited by that. Do you think that there is um, kind of a scenario where we move to doing all that imaging from phones? Well, we just do it right here, right? You know, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that we, we already, I can already take my phone and, and I, can get, I can get a reasonable picture of your optic nerve even, you know, in the right conditions without anything, without just my phone even. I have examples of that, you know. Um, my colleagues are doing some research on that. Of course, there's, there's more to it than that, but the potential to do that is, is, is very clear and very obvious to me. Uh, so yes, I think that is something. Now, of course, a wide field view is a different story. Uh, that's more complicated to do. Uh, but, you know, again, having an ability to, to do something, you know, at, at a diagnostic level doesn't mean necessarily coming in for all the regular visits. It can mean, again, we have things set up for people to get done when they need to get done without, again, having to have patients wait to see the doctor or have patients come and get exposure if there's a concern about that or other things, or patients can do it at their convenience or whatever. You know, we didn't talk about, for example, the whole online experience about patients' education, patients making their own appointments, patients figuring out, uh, you know, when they're going to be coming in for whatever they have to do. But, um, you know, what, what will drive some of this is going to be really uh, the, our patients and what they expect and what they demand. And the demand is to have more control on things and the demand is to take more control of your time. And the demand is to have it instant, right? You know, so technology and online will, will, will create this. This will create other problems as well. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm sure people are hearing this and they're going to be like, what the hell is this guy opening up all these doors, all these opportunities and questions? And that's okay. We need to do that. We need to, when we're blue sky things, we just put them up blue sky. And right now I see, I see in your, in your, in your window, in my window, the sky's pretty blue today. So we can do that. <laughs> uh, and then let all the haters come in there and say why it won't work. And I like to hear that because you know what? We have to make it work. And we have to decide what the sand traps are and avoid those things. But uh, the possibilities are there and let's think broadly and that's how we start with it. But I think like this is such a untapped area that we're all now jumped into. Um, and I think even government finally is coming around. I mean, at least they've given, given us the ability to, to do this right and fund, fund some of these things, which I think has been one of the barriers. So, um, you know, I think, I think that the right mix is here. And I think, you know, we should be taking the opportunity to do this now because there's no, no better 
proud to do this and think about this now. I agree. And like you said, there is so much demand, even just from the patients, to be able to have their eyes examined, get an answer, and be more active in their care. Uh, so I'm excited. It is. If I can say, if I can say one, one more point, one more yes. point to mention on this one is that, again, if we limit ourselves just to what we can get now, we really are, are limiting ourselves. And if we can think now, if we have now, if we have that data and we can capture that data and we can analyze it, right? We can use uh, new forms uh, of analytics to look at that kind of data. I mean, now we're getting into the world of AI, right? We're getting into the world of the ability to, to, to get beyond simply just, you know, an examination. And again, telemedicine, teleophthalmology, uh, telecare, all this stuff. Uh, allows us to document, analyze, and maybe capture data we can't normally capture. So to me, that's extremely exciting to allow us to be able to, uh, to, 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 to you know, track disease or, or screen patients that we never could before. Mm -hmm. I mean, the day will come where basically, you know, we can enable our camera uh, or, or our smartphone or our laptop to tell, us, tell you whether you have glaucoma. I know it sounds far-fetched. One, one of my good friends, Kizer Kaderi, has a company called Vizario that is looking at this kind of work. And it's not that far-fetched, actually, to think about the ability to look at cognition, eye tracking, perception abilities, everything else to develop new metrics. So, I mean, I know this, again, maybe I'm going too far ahead, but, um, you know, uh, we're not that far, actually. That's really, so does that scare you, being a glaucoma specialist, that that can all be automated? Well, it doesn't scare me, but it scares many of my colleagues, <laughs> you know, and it's funny because I'm a glaucoma surgeon. I do a lot of glaucoma surgery, and I've been lucky enough to be in, in the middle of all the new surgical interventions in glaucoma, which is amazing. But my dream is to retire glaucoma surgery. My dream is we never have to do glaucoma surgery because you know what? We can do this by gene therapy or we can do this, you know, by some other non-surgical method, neuroprotection, otherwise, whatever else it is, right? So, I mean, I, I mean, we, ha we, have to, we, have, we have to be thinking forward. I mean, and I think that th there's a habit of us, of course, to be, to be self-interested, which is a human nature and nat a natural interest in it. But I think, um, you know, we have an obligation and a duty, and I think we can actually all come out ahead if we can adapt to that, new, to that reality. And whether you want, it, you want it or whether I want it, I think is not the point. I mean, hu humans have a tendency to innovate and to advance. And whether it's fast or slow, uh, paradigms change and they will change. Um, and it's a matter of deciding whether you want to be part of it now or whether you want to be told what to do later on and maybe be outside the bubble, right? So that's what I feel. Yes, we fail. I fail. I make mistakes. I, I, some of my ideas, many of my ideas don't go too far, uh, but we get back up and we keep on going like we try doing. So uh, yeah, I, I, so no, I'm not scared at all. I mean, not at all. I, I'm very excited about it. In fact, I, I haven't operated very much in the last two months, but I've enjoyed all this stuff, thinking about this stuff and already designing new paradigms. It's been, it's been an amazing time to, uh, to be in medicine, to be in eye care. Incredible time. I, I totally agree, and I, I'm happy that we're on the same page. So we're pretty much up on time, but there is a question which I'd love to ask is related to AI, which you've brought up. So uh, the question is, you mentioned AI advances earlier. I'm curious as to how accepting your colleagues are regarding automi automated diagnoses or even treatments that could be done without human intervention. I think, I think the question kind of uh, states the point there that I think we have a lot of hesitation and, and it should be, it should be, it should be for good reason. Um, and I think that uh, we have to do this thoughtfully, we have to do it right. And that's again, why it's important that healthcare providers are in the middle of it. We don't, we don't, I don't think it's going to, it's a great idea. I don't think it's, it's, it's even advantageous for tech companies to do it on their own because the contextual uh, application of AI is critical to do this right. Uh, and I think doing it and I think having a partnership, I think is what's important. Uh, we already use some form of AI in many different ways. When you look at uh, an OCT printout, uh, but whether a patient has glaucoma or not, or whether they're normal or not, whether they, uh, or the visual field test is abnormal. I mean, we're already using for years some form of uh, artificial intelligence, whatever term you want to use. I know it's an overplayed term uh, in analytics uh, in some form of way. So we already are doing it. And I think it's the, it's, the, it's the partnership that I think really can make this powerful. Um, we already rely on our faking machines to tell us, you know, when to slow down the pump, right? When we get post-occlusion surge, you know, uh, we already do all these things already. And I think uh, we have to accept that. We have to, again, again, see how we can leverage it. The day where we completely are out of it completely, I think is still a long ways away. Uh, and, I, and I think I wouldn't worry about it because in those listening here in your lifetime, it probably, probably won't be there where you're not going to be completely out of it. 
uh, for many different reasons. So don't worry too much. Um, but again, I think the possibility is there and I think it does need some shepherding and yes, th dangerous things can happen. I mean, we all seen those movies. We've seen, we've seen pandemic, right? Uh, and we've seen, what's, I forgot that movie again. Um, many different AI movies, uh, to call There's, it um, ex machina, which I just yeah. watched so, recently. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have seen that we have seen when science and technology can turn negative, but mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to be, be in there. And I think we have, we don't have much of a choice to be honest with you. This is, this is uh, where we're at. I mean, my kids are virtual care, our, our virtual teaching, right? You know, and, and for those who basically shunned it and said, I don't, like, I don't want my kid to ever use an iPad ever. Well, you know what? They're having trouble adapting to the new world of education now, right? Of course, I'm not, I'm not advocating giving all kids iPads. But again, it's just the, it's the proper application and how we parent, for example, our child to use technology was what's important, not to just basically, you know, shun it. Same thing will be with healthcare as well. Not to shun it, but to but to but to provide the right guidelines and the framework to use it safely and effectively. I think that's what we really need to be focusing on. More importantly, there are obviously deleterious effects to all these potential technologies. We have to make sure we have safety in there, and that's what our job is as physicians. Mm -hmm. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you to Ike. Ike, like you, I'm not afraid. I embrace AI. I love robots. So let's see what happens. And uh, if, you, if anyone has questions, feel free to email me. Ike, thank you again. This was really fun and interesting. It's been a blast to, uh, to blue sky it with you. And yeah. uh, congratulations for what you are doing. I mean, you are uh, just out of, out of residency and you're already thinking so farther ahead. You're helping other residents around the US and around the world with what you're doing with Quadrant. I mean, congratulations. Keep it up. Um, and I uh, hope we can collaborate uh, more in the future. So, and to all of you again, thanks for being here and thanks for being part of this as well. Yeah, thank you so much and thanks for the kind words. Bye everyone. Take care, stay safe, be well.